welcome to the Equal Justice Forum podcast. Um, my name is Anthony Costello. The Equal Justice Forum is the Equal Justice Podcast is a forum for all those who seek truth, value tradition, and fight to defend the foundations of a moral and just society. I'm joined today by Logan Zapieri. Hey, Tony. And we are continuing, uh, without further ado, our exposition of a series of essays that was written by Dr. Nathan Cartagena, Assistant Professor of Philosophy at Wheaton uh, College in Wheaton, Illinois, on critical race theory, whereby Dr. Cartagena has been attempting to provide for us a defense uh, to some degree of critical race theory and its potential to sort of um, revitalize the church. Um, and we did a previous uh, episode on a panel discussion that Dr. Cartagena was involved with four other scholars um, who are involved with or under the auspices of the Christian Council or the Council for Christian Colleges and Universities. So we will link to that as well. Uh, so Logan, we have part three here of the three yeah. part series. Um, and in this, I have to say at the outset, this was probably the most confusing of uh, the three parts. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah. I, I would have to say, clear. and I'm trying not to be just purely polemical, uh, even though by now I'm sure anyone who's watched our videos knows that we are very highly skeptical of critical race theory as a workable theory to begin with, and um, very concerned about its potential as a worldview uh, through which reality can be uh, all of human culture. Uh, to include uh, religion uh, can and should be assessed or viewed. Um, so in this part three, which again, the, the, the whole uh, series is just entitled What Christians Get Wrong About Riddle, Critical Race Theory. I have to say that by the end of part three, I was just more confused than when I first started reading the essays. So I'd have to say as a hopefully critical reader, I do not think that Dr. Cartagena has met his goal of providing clarity about critical race theory or critical legal theories, uh, more than just sort of thrown at us a bunch of links to books on critical race theory and critical legal yeah, studies. Or, exactly. And I think, I mean, this is something that we had a concern when we first yeah. started, is that we wanted to know, well, A, is he going to clearly define critical race theory? Because that was his launching argument against many evangelicals though most of the predominant ones that were engaged in this topic he skipped over right but he wanted to say okay we don't address it accurately so i'm going to give a accurate presentation of it and we were but we were wondering if he was going to try to christianize crt or just accept it kind of full-throated whatever it is that it's being done it seems like by the end he's just going to accept crt as is so this, this idea of taking bits and pieces of CRT that work and not, which is a common defense I've seen him make and others who are kind of like kind of run the same pack make. Right. It's not looking like it's coming out in the work where he's saying, oh, there's certain things that are problematic with CRT and we need to discard those. It's more of just here's CRT. It's all super helpful. Let's accept it all. Right. Unless you critique it. It's like, well, there's some things that are questionable. Well, there, course, there was no attempt to define that. And, and even there though, in the let's accept it all, the all is still incredibly vague as to what the end goals of these theories are. I mean, in one of the uh, essays that is embedded, the Duncan Kennedy essay, I mean, one could say that one thing that critical race theories simply want is quotas, just quotas. I mean, quotas would at least be something concrete whereby, and I think this did come out in the CCCU panel discussion, institutions just have to hire more people of color, period. Um, okay, you know, and that's something that those institutions in our, uh, for our domain here, we're talking primarily about Christian colleges, universities, seminaries, maybe even church leadership, I suppose. Yeah. And that's where, again, and this it, could uh, apply it, to that, you know. Well, even with the quota thing, it becomes yeah. 
very bizarre because the question would be quotas in contrast to what do population distribution? I don't know. It right. seems like it's just, we just need to hire more of whatever class yeah. that one has defined as in a press class. You just need to hire those people, but it, it yep. seems like it's not in regard to right demographic representation. If that's the argument, there's no, it's just, you have the action, but there's no standard by which to measure success or failure. Right. The standard is just that diversity, it, the diversity itself of different, of people from different cultural backgrounds, because you cannot separate individual from their culture mm -hmm. um is that you will just get different viewpoints and in, ha and in virtue of having different viewpoints culture will the culture more broadly will will um will benefit yeah um and that's about the best that i could sum up for example like kennedy's uh argument that you just yeah. want diversity because it, it you know, so, I mean, in which diversity and meritocracy are pitted against each other uh, in this sense. So yeah. diversity would, would be sort of replace meritocracy almost. Yeah. But, but this um, is, but this is, yeah. the, and this is going right to the first, I guess this would be the second quote that appears at the top of the first page of part three, where he quotes Kimberly Crenshaw. And I th this will play an important role towards the end of the section, which is why I want to read right. it. He yeah. says, because the, or rather she says, because the intersectional experience is greater than the sum of racism and sexism, any analysis, so even CRT analysis, that does not take intersectionality into account cannot sufficiently address particular the particular manner in which black women are subordinated. This is where I think when people say CRT is just a method, CRT is just a set of tools, and we respond, well, there are other things being trafficked in, and they go, no, no, nothing else being trafficked in. I think this is borderline disingenuous because they're the scholars that he's quoting is very explicit is going, actually, you need all these other things too to make it sufficient, namely intersectionality. Right. You need intersectionality, which again is going to be, and then when you know, if we get to we might mention Angela, the Angela Harris article that was also embedded in Dr. Cartagena's essays on feminist anti-essentialism. So again, the the what you are trying to take is fundamentally uh, has a has an, a metaphysics that is that is entirely incompatible with um, a historic Christian metaphysics, yeah. and an epistemology. We got to keep pointing back to the first things, right? Which is something we addressed in our previous uh, podcast on the ten questions every Christian should ask before getting involved in a social justice movement. Question yeah. number seven, I believe, was what are the first things of the movement you're getting involved in? Yeah. And when you have an anti-essentialism across the board, like across the board, there's not even, yeah. there's nothing essential to womanhood. There's nothing essential to uh, manhood. There's nothing essential to the human person. Yeah. Um, where, like we said, it's almost like. Um, well, it's no longer just a method is the, is the yeah, underlying point a, that needs to be made. A, that's a claim. That's a, that's a philosophical claim about what, uh, what about reality. Yeah, the, or I think I think pick a vance with the the, the the furniture. Or maybe that's Moreland. The 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 furniture in the world. It, it says that with intersectionality, it, it hits epistemology through complex right. personal identities through the experience which those produce, and then you have the anti-essentialism, which is a metaphysical claim, right. and that's the only way in which CRT gets off the ground. So even if they make the claim that CRT is just a method, it only gets off the ground with a particular set of metaphysical claims and a particular set of epistemological claims that are fundamentally at odds with Christianity. And I'll be honest, I think that's where we don't, we have not really encountered a lot of good work yet. Um, I mean, the one, the, the, the uh, Christians who seem to want to embrace critical race theory uh, want to just skip completely over those first, those issues of first things, not really, not, not mention them, not bring them up, not deal with them, which we're going to see with Kenneth Nunn's work, which is incre an incredibly scary piece of um, scholarship. Although uh, it seems like Dr. Cartagena wants to um, considers it the best thing since sliced bread, yeah. but, um, <laughs> but, you know, I haven't seen a lot of people who are resisting or pushing back on critical race theory haven't really explored 
some of the deeper problems in its metaphysics and its epistemology. So hopefully we'll see more of that yeah. uh, as well. I mean, the epistemology is even, even uh, more um, uh, problematic, to put it yeah. lightly. Oh, yeah. So, okay, uh, critical rate, uh, so it starts off talking about Kenneth Nunn and how the words of Kenneth Nunn uh, haunt him. Now, this article we can link to, and this one I've written on, um, yeah. you know, now he only cites a small portion of that article where he says law, uh, quoting Nunn, Nunn says, quote, law organizes white society, then it helps maintain that society through both physical and ideological coercion, end quote. Now, what he doesn't say about Nunn's article, which was called Eurocentric um, Law as a Eurocentric Enterprise, I think uh, it might not be the full title, but yeah. uh, paraphrasing here, is that Nunn basically uh, takes two attacks, uh, two lines of attack at European culture broadly. Because Europeans started sort of becoming uh, developing racial hierarchies in or around the late 15th, early 16th century. The idea is that there are certain cognitive capacities um, that for, form sort of like a nefarious matrix uh, uh, that is displayed primarily by Europeans. And we've listed the, I've listed these out in my own writing, these, uh, these seven cognitive capacities like rationality, he calls it hyper-rationality, uh, abstraction, objectification, um, uh, uh, dichotomous thinking, right? So literally um, these modes of thought that are highly problematic and that lend to things like thinking that there can be universal laws that apply to all people, right? So again, and we've mentioned this before, how you're gonna reconcile that with a, a, a biblical worldview. If you're gonna say yeah. that the idea of universally applicable laws is just a construct of white culture, right? Yeah. Then I do not see how you do not also take out the Bible on the same, yeah. on the same ground. Well, I think, I think when most people read this, like say, I, I forgot what magazine this was also published in faith magazine. Uh, I don't remember faith who magazine. Was, something like that. Um, when, when, when the lay person reads that quote, law organizes white society, then it helps maintain that society through both physical and ideological coercion. We think for whatever reason, we, we very often just impute, Oh, certain laws have been passed by white people such that they keep the white people in power. And we all think, well, that's totally yeah, wrong. Right. And we exactly. should get rid of those laws. That's not what Kenneth Nunn is saying. He's saying law as law thing itself, not laws in the particular law. The thing itself is a construct right. of white society. And because it's a construct of white society, things governed by law, not necessarily by laws, by law keeps white people in power. Now, right. white people is also being redefined, not necessarily by the color of their skin, because he talks about white derived or European derived societies. It's those societies which accept law, not necessarily laws, but law as an effective means of government. Which would be I mean, it's super I radical. Basically, say at this point the idea that there are universal morals that apply to all people throughout history that that itself is a white construct. I mean, it, it's the same thing. So um, this is the historic, this is the historicism of Hegel on the one side, but then of course, Mark, Marx turning Hegel on its head, on his head, where Hegel, yes, there's, there, there's a way of thinking about reality in every sort of moment in history. Of course, Hegel, Hegel thought that was progressing to an end state as human thought, human ideas sort of were synthesized together and then that we'd re reach this culminating state of the absolute spirit, the culmination of history through abstract thinking, right? Yeah, yeah. There's this a form of historicism. The Marxist one, of course, is the dialectic of materialism where it's material conditions, right? That are coming together, synthesizing, and then just through the material conditions, you know, there'll be um, a culminating, com you know, historical community, 
Okay. Um, so historicist thinking though is, is, I mean, terribly problematic. If you, we apply that to the Christian worldview, it, it essentially, and always has taken out the idea of revelation. I mean, revelation is not an inbreaking of an ex, you know, of knowledge that we otherwise would not have had because God has spoken to us, right? That's not revel revelation then on a historist view is just kind of like the best guess about what God might be like by those people in those cultures as they wrote the Bible. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, and we've talked about the, this, the problem of sort of like correlation views of theology. So if I, I just think we got to continue to emphasize for people who want to embrace the principles of a critical race theory, the epistemic principle of historicism, then you, you should, if you're consistent, I think um, also ditch the idea that there can be anything like divine revelation that yeah, is well, applicable throughout uh, trans historically, trans culturally, trans temporally. Sorry. Once you get rid of this idea that law, yeah, not laws. I mean, this is it's, it, these are subtle distinctions in the philosophical realm, but have massive impact in how it plays out. Once you uh, once you start attacking the concept of law, the question is how does the concept of law get up and off? It's things like are there things that are transcendent of a very particular cultural moment? So the idea that, you know, thou shalt not murder, is that a, you know, temporally located law along a progression of how laws develop? Or is it a representation of, you know, quote unquote law as this is a way in which human beings should interact. Now, what's important, well, oh, go ahead. Well, and I, I just want to say that I think we, I mean, and I've, I've started enjoying this book. I just started reading Igbo Jurisprudence, uh, an African philosophy of law by Nkusi Michael Naam. Um, and I, I have to say that anybody who um, thinks that more uh, pre-colonial pre systems of customary law that were found in places like Africa, and I have some scholarly articles on Aztec law that I'm gonna get to eventually as well, that African cultures were not positing a universal laws grounded in religious beliefs. Um, again, the, the whole idea of historic, historicism is very much an enlight, a, a Western European enlightenment idea. Yeah. Right. Well, and that so was this is borrowing from Marx, a white German guy, and Hegel, a white German guy. To say that basically um, accepting this historicist view of, uh, 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 of you know, uh, law or yeah. knowledge. But if you go to pre-colonial Igbo jurisprudence, there's a universalizing um, mindset that laws are universal. And I'll, I'll just read, I'll quote here, um, page 44 why there's a universalizing way of thinking about morals and laws in the Igbo uh, tribal uh, world, pre-colonial world. And I quote, among the Igbo, religion and law are so closely interwoven that many of the most powerful legal san sanctions are derived directly from gods. As a preliminary, therefore, to study, to the study of the legal system of the Igbo, it will be necessary to give some description of their theology, end quote. They have, there's a metaphysics. There's yeah. a metaphysics that the Igbo had prior to the, colonial, the colonists getting there that actually was much, because they were a monotheistic culture too, mm -hmm. that is actually very close to what we will find in the Old Testament. Yeah. Well, and this is so the audience can keep track of what we're doing. You have Nathan quoting uh none and then we're saying well even in none's caricaturing of your western european concepts of law is also flawed so you're seeing well if anything systemic in right here is, is this, these connections of unsubstantiated claims about european law about the ju justification of european law and then making those cases against all these other 
cultures that don't accept these things like universalized law. Now that's actually a very common feature Yes, in, in human cultures outside or inside of Western Europe. I mean, and none, to none's, I don't know, credit or discredit. I mean, he does some of these deeply embedded footnotes where he makes these claims like it's, uh, and this is in my, my, uh, my uh, online article, uh, but where he'll make a claim. And then again, this, this is in Nunn's article, but again, we're talking about uh, Dr. Cartagena saying that Kenneth Nunn's words haunt him which you know, seems to be sort of uh, a way of saying that he really finds Kenneth Nunn's work excellent or incisive or you know, uh, worth propagating. And in Nunn's work, uh, the essay, again, Euro, uh, Law is a Eurocentric Enterprise, he'll, he'll, he'll walk the dog back slightly and say, some of these features can be found in other cultures, but in European culture, they've come together in this sort of, again, this matrix that is allowed for racialized thinking to occur. Okay, so he'll make the typical sort of qualifying remarks, but they're either deeply embedded in some footnote or, or, um, or you know, they're just one-liners and then like uh, three pages about why European culture is like this and other cultures aren't. Um, yeah. So those kinds of little escape hatches are, I think they're just, it, it's kind of, it, it, you, can, you don't really take them seriously. Yeah. Um, well, and this is, I think, yeah. it, you know, so, so like the question is, why does Kenneth Nunn's um, words haunt Nathan? And he says, because he thinks it, uh, or I'll just quote Nathan. Yeah. Uh, Nunn's disturbing insight anticipates the racial violence and governmental responses we've witnessed these past weeks. So he's referring to uh, the George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmed Arbery um, killings. Now, what? Okay, so when he so this is this is again connecting to Nunn's quote, both physical and ideological coercion. What is being extended here is this is where you get this idea of defund the police, because what it's not um, racial discrimination as racial discrimination that we've realized or, or we've come to know through different documentaries or through the US history. What they're saying is that law, as the, the concept by which governments can operate, because it's a white society, police force de facto, because it's the executive branch by which laws are executed, are also part of the white supremacy project of quote unquote law, because law enforcement is the extension or the physical extension of the concept of law. So, so people can understand, because you hear, what's yeah. with the defunding the police? No one understands it. Because what they're saying is law, not laws, right? They never go to laws. This law is racist, that law is racist. Law is racist. And those who enforce law are also, because right. it's just that, a natural extension. In, in, in theory, I suppose, you could have only black police officers. I mean, we have to, we gotta keep pointing this out. What? Which, Maybe, uh, but that's not even clear yeah. because in Kenneth Nunn's article, they would say, well, black police officers are just w Western European derived. Oh, right. This is what people got to clear. You could have a, you could have this country. You could have the U S tomorrow. We could swap out every white F every, every person who has European heritage swapped out with an African American or an African. Okay except maybe not Elon Musk, because after all, he is an African American. <laughs> that was awesome. Yeah, yeah I mean... Wallace was pointed out recently, that was good. <laughs> He's a disabled African American and people are all over. Okay, but you could have a, all black, basically police force, it wouldn't matter. It would still be racist. Yes. Yeah, it would still be a white supremacist police force, even yet all blacks, if they if those black police officers accepted principles of law um, that were developed out of Europe. And again, here's this, what I think is just this massive genetic fallacy that's being made, right? Um, and if they accepted that there was such a thing as standards of law, standards of moral behavior, even I think you could press it that far, um, you could, so you could have an all black, black police force, all black, not one white person in the entire police force in the country 
and it could still be uh, white supremacist. Yeah. Okay. And this goes to the point when they say we just need to resist or mediate. I think that's underplaying what they're looking at. They're, they're looking at subverting the entire concept of law. And maybe the only thing you get is, like I said in previous podcasts, is once you get the dissolution of law, then it's just prejudice and preference that and, govern. And 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 strong and who strong it, tactics. And that's what I'm saying. It's it's then it goes down to just actually you see the realization of power dynamics because the only people who can maintain control in a system like that is not the appeal to law as the adjudicating authority, but the guy who can enforce it. Right. I mean, I it's I have to say this. And again, we're not trying to attack Dr. Cartagena personally. I've heard from other sources. He's a wonderful man. We know that. We're going to we believe that. But I think yeah. I would want to say it is very disturbing to see or hear someone like Dr. Cartagena uh, buying into this. It's very disturbing. Yeah. Um, and that's, again, and that's not to reject the history of bad laws developed by people who had internal uh or who had s- wicked dispositions yeah. and and created laws to their advantage and to the detriment of others we were not obviously that's just what the civil again what the civil rights movement was or, yeah. or the or the civil war even or as yeah. obviously and also i have to say pointing out again to this book there's some excellent primary source material here even just to push back a little bit on the on the naive narrative of slavery and the slave trade this book has some excellent quotes about upon the abolition of the slave trade in britain british generals and their troops going into parts of benin other parts of of northern africa and fighting war battles against African kings who wanted to keep the slave trade because it was Mm -hmm. lucrative. So you literally have British soldiers fighting African warlords or kings on their homeland because the African kings didn't want to give into abolition. Yeah. So and and this is the well, this is the upshot. But based upon what were the British soldiers fighting? Universal human law. Universal. Right. Exactly. So there, there is no, there is no, and this is where like, so, right. He, so you have the Kenan, the quote, he, he then talks about black, chanting black lives matter and defund the police. And as being not enough. Yeah. Well, not we're, enough we're, as these are God glorifying anti-racist actions. Those. You shouldn't have been doing those, but here's the thing. So he says, yeah. right. So he wants to say that chanting black lives matter and defund the police. He said, these are God glorifying anti-racist actions, which I think there, I think right there could be an interesting debate that it's not very clear. And a lot of Christian universities come out against the Black Lives Organization as not being God glorifying at all in its statement of faith, I would say. But then he says, um, while marching upon blood soaked stolen lands. Now here's the here's the interesting part. Once law is gone, under what under what system can you say that blood soaked lands are wrong? Like just play it out all the way. If yeah. if it's if it's not based on human law, the Europeans had better, the Europeans had better guns, or they had guns. I mean, yeah. Jared Diamond wrote a book years ago called "Guns, Germs, and Guns, Germs, and Steel," mm-hmm. um, and he's a just like sort of a more modernist atheist. So I mean, but he doesn't talk. He just talks about hey, you know, European that Europeans had guns and steel. They, the Indians didn't, yeah. or the Native Americans didn't. So, what's the law that we're pointing to, if uh, that they, that should have constrained or restrained the Europeans? Yeah. Well, and this is where once you get rid of law as a concept as inherently racist or white supremacist, then upon what do you judge someone's uh, someone else's actions is inherently wrong, legally speaking. Now, the other at now the other part of nun's article first he he attacks the seven sort of what i call cognitive features because they just see features yeah. features of the mind and says that other cultures don't display these as much they do but not in this matrix the other thing he does he just asserts that there are certain certain kinds of moral flaws that european yeah. cultures have that non-european cultures don't display as much 
Mm -hmm. You know, and this is where you start wondering if there's not something like when, when you read Nunn's article, something like Rene Girard's scapegoat theory going on here, mm -hmm. where the sins of the world are getting put onto a particular group of people um, and other sort of groups that we could identify even at this at this level major cultures yeah. are exculpated of their of their sins in virtue of laying them all upon but just keep that yeah. in the back well, it, again this I mean, as this you is, read some of the crt material well and this is where i think there's so many inherent contradictions in the reasoning because if you do away with human essentialism then why is it considered white supremacy or white generated law there's no understanding by which white is even understood because there's nothing that's essentially white or european or european yeah that's what i'm saying so it's like you're starting right. to ham away a lot of these essentialism the universal yeah. laws but then you're trying to grab them up just enough to use them to advance your claims which right is and this yeah, this is a technical point in nun's article but he so he ascribes these moral deficiencies to europeans like aggression mm -hmm competitive nature, competitiveness, and materialism, and one or two yeah. others. So, you know, uh, and that, almost like irreverence, almost. Yeah. Do, doing away Disrespect with respect for nature and, and everything, yeah. you know, and there, there might, there's, 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 there's truth in that, but there's truth in that for every culture, right? With yeah. the exception, maybe of, you want to talk post enlightenment Europe as a very secularized culture and, there is this one touch point, and I pointed this out in a discussion I had recently with Carl Truman. There may be one touch point for the traditional Christian and the critical race theorists if critical race theorists are worried about this desacralization of sort of the created order, right? And and that yeah, we've going back to almost the French Enlightenment, which we quoted yeah. Rousseau in right. Philosophs, right. which were doing some very I mean, interesting work, but very devastating work. It ends yeah. up turning. Yeah, out. I mean, we are we are not humans, or mm -hmm. Voltarians uh, by any, by by any means as, as biblical Christians. Okay, but these 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 moral attributes or these moral failures or flaws or deficiencies are just ascribed to you, and they're said that they're they're to be fundamental to the European cult to Europeans, fundamental fun part of their fundamental yeah. nature. Now, mm -hmm. deep embedded in a footnote, and I got in a big arg argument on Facebook with him. <laughs> oh, you didn't read that? It's like way, this huge footnote way in there. He's he sort of, again, what tries to walk the dog back on what he means by calling it a fundamental nature. Mm -hmm. But it's pretty clear in the main text, he says it's fundamental. It's part of the fundamental nature of Europeans to be aggressive and to be competitive yeah. and, and materialistic and so on and so forth. So now you've set up European culture in such a way where there's these cognitive features that europeans display that lead to racism and then there's these just these moral flaws that just europeans have okay so uh and that's basically nun's argument you know and therefore the system of law that they've created is just it's not that there's just problems that need to be tweaked it's that the whole foundation have to, has to be entirely removed Do well and this is where i think of, and know, maybe well yeah. this is where i because you you just said something and I want to yeah. make sure if, if maybe what you said was correct or not. You said the system of law that Europeans created. It seems like though that none isn't making that there's different systems of law. It's just law itself. So like whatever systems can be generated with the concept of law is inherently white supremacist. Yeah. I mean, um, well, I mean, in the article, like was... Athenian law would be, well, any any system of law that posits that law can be universal. Yeah. And that's what, so I just want, you know, again, I know I'm harping on a technical point, yeah, but for no, the audience, it's like, yeah. it's so natural to slip into, oh, there are certain kinds of laws that are racist. Because that's just, yes, absolutely. But when you say law that can be systematized is racist, well, that's a very different argument because you're not attacking particular laws, no. but a particular conception, a conception of a legal system as law. Yeah. So it has to be the conception itself upon which, of course, the actual uh, system is built. The conception yes. is the problem. Mm -hmm. you know, Europeans, have, uh, they have these 
fa- these fundamental flaws in their nature that have so that their the what you know the their understanding of what law is is it emerged is itself uh, uh, has to be de- deconstructed. Yeah, and so that's basically the first page of the the article. He does end with the quote. When people lack a critical understanding of the reality, apprehending it in fragments, which they do not perceive as interacting constituent elements of the whole, they cannot truly know that reality. I thought that was fair, but I think if you're going to do that, that's what we're doing now is, okay, look at the metaphysical, look at the epistemological conclusions of what you're saying and say, okay, can you actually build anything on this? And this was this quote by Ferrer, who is the um, Brazilian... Uh, uh, from uh, author from the '60s, although I, I I think that's a problematic statement. Um, when people act a critic of their reality, and this is sort of I mean it, it there's postmodern language in that. Yeah, it, it depends on how much weight you put on there. If you're saying the things which you bump into, yeah, that's no reality way. which you're touching, having comp- fine. But if they're saying the uh, yeah, if you lack a critical understanding of the reality you've created yourself. Yeah. Obviously, I think that would be immensely problematic. I mean, I wanted to just point out two other points about this first page. One is, again, the conflation of Ahmad Arbery's uh, murder with Breonna Taylor and George Floyd. Now, we know when Nathan wrote this, he didn't know what the outcome of the George Floyd um, trial was going to be. We now know that uh, Derek Chauvin was found guilty of second and was it second and third degree murder? Um, and that I'm not 100%. Brought, I, think I don't it was remember sec- exactly the third, uh, a, a degree of murder, and that probably was a, a just verdict. Ahmad yeah. Arbery was just gunned down in the street by some thugs, uh, uh white yeah. thugs that probably were sort of racist in the in the, the, the simple sense of the word, the straightforward yeah. sense of the word. But then also the Black Lives Matter and defund the police, as if these are things Christians should have been doing. Um, you know, the defund the police um, narrative, I don't think, I think it's it's very debatable about whether the people in those communities actually want that. I think that is a live debate. Um, yeah. Whether or not the black communities, the inner city black communities are, are on board with that slogan that comes from these more public entities like Black Lives Matter, the organization, who again, we should point out is living quite large off of the backs of many in their million dollar mansions. Yeah. Um, Okay. Now the next section critical. Now this gets, oh boy. Uh, Critical race theorists on gendered races. Um, Okay. Why don't you, why don't you start off on this section? Yeah. Well, it's, I think, yeah, this was a pretty difficult. Okay. So there's a few things that, needs to be made first is this idea that there are, I think, legitimate criticisms because there's a line, there's a line of thinking that's happening that does culminate in the eugenics period, which was wrong and was in most part, which is what World War II was fought over. I mean, there was definitely some military aggressions that happened and that devolved into the, the, you know, the dealing with the Jewish people, you know, so with Nazi Germany and there was eugenics problems happening in the United States at the time. There were some good books written. Um, I think it's called like the immortal cell, something about Henry. So there's some, there's some good books out there about the eugenics programs that was happening within the Western civilization. And I think those critiques are, are fair to be made. Now, the question though, there are, how, how do you connect the rise of bad laws with the concept of law? And how do you connect bad laws with inherently gender-based analysis? This is what this section is going to try to do. Now, he quotes some people. Um, and I have uh, to say some of these. Tommy quotes, Curry. And again, I, I know he's writing a book. And I, we know in the book he's not going to do things like Derek Bell says we have to look at history. I mean, <laughs> you just don't quote something that simplistic. But um yeah you know like that just doesn't say anything although n- knowing what we know about the pro- of historicism again as a part of social theory yeah okay if derek bell would probably say 
you can only look at history. There are, again, there's nothing a priori mm-hmm. um, because reason itself is just uh, a product of historical conditions. So, but yeah. yeah. No, so, so yeah, he does, he does a lot of those kinds of quotes, but then it gets down. So basically what's he want, what he wants to say is that uh, it's at, um, I guess it's like last paragraph. It just kind of breaks it. As Curry's comments imply, the gendered conception of races were hierarchical. Some races had evolved further and so were superior to those lagging behind. The white Anglo-Saxon race was deemed superior and thus masculine. All others were deemed lesser and thus feminine. And then he quotes a few people who've made these arguments. Some of them were foundational arguments for making the case that because of the color of your skin, if you were black, you were less superior. Now this does fly in the face of the laws that were being passed going back to America's founding who did address this. And they said, and I think this was Pennsylvania. And I think this was the state of New York as well, which said something to the effect that we don't know the intellectual abilities of those of other races. We know that there are people who look very different. We also know that they look different in some sort of homogenous fashion. Those are black. These are white. Those are Native Americans. They can see the, you can see the difference. They don't know what comes of it. And they say, but despite any of that, we know where they're all created by the same God. End of story. Treat them equally. So he, he's going to ignore all of the, that legal precedence. He's going to ignore the abolition of the slave trade by um, making it a capital offense to engage in the slave trade. You were to be executed. We're the, we're the bigger thinkers. I mean, I, I don't know. I want to be careful here because I think most, almost everybody he's quoting here referencing here would be considered a social scientist i'm assuming or a sociologist no probably but you know one has to I, I just had to ask the question who the hell are these people like i don't i mean have these people been that influential because they seem incredibly obscure now i'm saying that as somebody who doesn't read a ton of sociology admit yeah. But I mean, well, I mean, sociology has had a rocky past as a science, generally speaking, not being able to be validated. I yeah. mean, the question is, what is groups like they can't get the main main object of analysis off metaphysically off. And so this goes into I wonder why I wonder if CRT is a is interest, interesting for them because it has a way of metaphysically sidestepping the question of what's a group. They've never yeah. been able to get past that. And your pre, your point that you made before about is it revenge against the logical positivists who <laughs> dismissed it as an the non theory, you know, yeah. or, or not even a, not even a real domain of of um, knowledge or yeah uh, intellectual pursuit, but I mean I just I mean again it it's hard to say oh you pastors and finger wave about because they haven't read Robert Park or Jules Michelet or Franz E. Pruner. I mean, okay. I mean, again, I may be totally wrong. And these people may have had huge influences in the last hundred years. Uh, and I'm not saying I'm the best read person in the world. And, but I don't know. I mean, you, you and I together and with Jacob and with other people that we know, um, I, I just don't, I can't imagine these people have really had that much influence. Yeah. I um, think that they have, I don't know. Okay. Well, you know, so we, we have these questions coming up, but then he quotes this one. It was, he says, uh, well, first he just kind of stipulates that they create these racial hierarchies and then the best ones are masculine and the worst ones are feminine. And then he just does quote, Africa is a woman, her races are feminine and then moves on. Read that link. Yeah. From, yeah. Okay. I'll grant, I will grant that it's a weird passage. It talks about some weird stuff about the things that this person, whoever the author is, looks like likes. a really weird book. What was it like from that? Was one of the more eight, well, that was one of the 19th century books, too, wasn't it? Um, that one was older, yeah. It's it is definitely an older book. Uh, yeah. some of the spellings, like how they spell Haiti and stuff, is always is older spelling. It's I like a 19th century book that he's talking that he's and he's up- well, he's talking about why he gives this very interesting comment about uh, sexual attraction between compliments and versus um, opposites and the relationship between the black woman and the white man and the why they should be together and the 
the vitality of the female and how she can solve business problems. And then talks about how, um, wherever the, the African goes, youthfulness and beauty abound. It's an interesting sort of lovey kind of passage in which it's trying to talk about why white men and black women should be together. But what, putting that aside, and it's not that the white woman and black man being together is a weird part. It's the how he describes it and he's, how he's trying to connect it with facial features. And he talks about how the American slave trade is destroying the, uh, the black woman because it's making their nose wider. It's a very bizarre. And then saying that he likes the Haitian cultures because it's making them more true back to who they were and the beauty abounds in them. It's just a very bizarre passage. Yeah. But it's not supporting what he's claiming, namely that because Africa is feminine, therefore it's evil. It's actually predominantly talking about the goodness of why they like black women. Yeah. Yeah. This I So that was just a bizarre situation. Um that I don't know if you want to say it's academically incorrect or disingenuous. Some it, it just doesn't match what's going on. It might be, and this goes back to well, a, a comment that- the work. The quote's not doing the work that he wants it to do. Yes, and this goes back to a point that Chesterton made, maybe that it applies here. He talks about, you have standards, say, so he uses the example standard of beauty, and then he'll go and talk about how different time periods will try to realize that standard differently. So he talks about in, you know, in some cultures, they want a thin woman is beautiful and other cultures, it's a heavier set woman is beautiful. Right. Now he just wants to say those, but like you can't confuse that with the idea that there is objective standard, which people are trying to get to and they're doing it different ways, but the standard is still there in the same way. You could read that passage and go, that's a really weird way to talk about a woman or a black woman, but you have to realize, okay, but what is it? What work is it trying to do? Is the passage, is it trying to just be demeaning in a different kind of way? Or is it trying to be, I guess, supportive in a very different kind of way? Not saying it's right or wrong, but you have to understand the kind of the angle at which these passages are taking. Because the way I understood what Nath what Dr. Cartagena, what Nathan was trying to do here was say that white 19th century writers, um, you know, they uh, being woman womanhood or femininity has a negative connotation. So to call Africa or Africans womanish or feminine is to sort of heap on yet another sort of negative sort of uh, characteristic so that you can continue to keep them sort of yeah on the on the low end of the racial scale yeah right? but he's doing it isolated from the context in which that term could be used in a different time period not necessarily to say subjective language but to say that there was a different agenda going on. Right. And that, I don't think that that. I, mean, I mean, this goes back to, you know, I was talking to people, friends at Biola, um, and they were like, you know, oh, ancient culture, you just hated women. I said, okay, but it's interesting because you have to be careful because every, almost every virtue was characterized as a, as a woman. Yeah. And so you have to ask, okay, how do, you, how do you understand the subjection of women in a classical society, given that the things they worshiped were female or feminine? Mm -hmm. And so. the god, the gods that the Igbo, the, the one of the main points about the Igbo jurisprudence is when a crime is committed, it's co committed first and foremostly against the god Ani, the goddess Ani. Mm -hmm. So um, now, if that means that, Af but that I don't think that means that uh, now. So there's a couple of things. One is this idea that he's saying Europeans had this negative view of fe of femininity. So they apply that to Africans to keep them subjugated on the racial scale. That'd be one thing. That there are other critical race theorists like none, and then none, of course, is listing off all these other people who want to have an Afrocentric view of law that yeah. would incorporate the feminine into law, which this sounds very Herbert Marcuse, <laughs> funny enough, yeah. who was not, again, white German guy. Um, <laughs> but but then it's like, okay, I mean, certainly there was there was goddess worship prior to that, Christianity coming into Africa. There was goddess well, worship everywhere. Well, that was the prior to Christianity. Yeah, every, so that that's applying to Rome and Athens. I was talking about, but the quote he quote, he yeah. refers to about the Africa is a woman, her races are feminine. 
that passage does address also that he was saying that an observation, he seems that a lot of the tribes were run by women. And he talks about women being able to solve complex business transactions. And so, yeah, so I really an observational description as well. It's going, it's just, you have to take it all in. That's what I'm saying. Like when you make right. so oh, that is an anthropological right. question. And I'm not going to say that I've studied a sufficient number of African tribes to know what the percentage was of matriarchies versus patriarchies. I'm just looking at the Igbo. And of course, in this book, he references the Yoruba and the Hausa. And these do not look like they were matriarchal societies, even if they had mm -hmm. goddess worship. It's, uh, it's very clear. And I'll just quote again, I'll quote um, that the elders are always men. And yeah. the elders... The elder, just like in the in the Old Testament, they are the ones who decide on all matters of custom and law. It's always mm -hmm. the um, uh, titled men. Quote: uh, now, um, Titled men are regarded as religious and righteous. Um, otherwise, they would not have been blessed by Eru, the god of wealth. A titled man is. A titled man is subject to countless rules and regulations, which he must obey or renounce his title. But then he goes on to say that it is those titled men who ultimately make the adjudications yeah. over any issue in the tribe, in the, in, in the village. Mm -hmm. And my brother who works in Nigeria sees this still today firsthand. Um, it's a, he, he says here, quote, a school of thought even has it that every village of prehistoric Igbo had as its true leaders, men of high title. Yeah. In those days, the titled men served as bankers to the people, not simply because they had enough themselves, but mainly because they were trustworthy enough for people to deposit their propitious assets with them, end quote. So they were also the financial leaders and, and custodians. And I just think you're going to find that in 90% of any ancient society. Women yeah. will have their role, obviously, but it's going to be about the same as what we find in the Bible, I bet. Yeah, that's my that's what I'm guessing at least. Yeah, and so I mean the the, the point I think that's getting across is one and still hammering out at nuns. I think missing a lot of what's going on in Africa, but then also Nathan's quote about Africa is feminine is well in some cases you're saying is is just incorrect. The fact it's just not happening or we're seeing that it's, there's just a bizarre passage in which they're trying to talk about the role of the feminine features in the particular passage he's quoting. So it's, if there's just an oversimplification, like a radical oversimplification, yeah. it picking quotes and then not trying to figure out even some of the harder cultural context in which going, okay, well, how much of this is a, cause I don't know what society they're referring to the, the passage. I didn't read the whole book to just understand that passage, but he is definitely talking about the sexual pleasures with a, a black woman and why it's desirable odd passage but it's not doing the work he's quoting it to do all right well moving right along so again I, the idea is here is that 19th century particularly it seems like 19th century race theorists were were trying to then claim that european culture white culture was the most masculine and yeah, that's kind of the the right. argument of that section is that that's the argument. The most mac masculine, they're um, superior. He's not very clear on superior, except he uses the quote that maybe they evolved. That was some of the arguments, and that was some of the arguments. Yeah. Um, now, but again, I think he's missing the counterclaims, which is that there was a thread of arguments that definitely denied this. We have the legal documents through and through the counter arguments being made. We do wonder what's going to be in the book. Yeah, I hope it, it does both sides justice where when he says, oh, the slave trade was a bad thing. He's also noting all the laws to abolish the slave trade and the capital offenses yes. that were being introduced. And again, to we'll, we'll link to this book where he can it's this is a scholarly work um, and we he can reference the British soldiers fighting against the African uh, kings in Northern Africa who still wanted to maintain the slave trade. Okay. Um, and then he ends this penultimate section here about the Greaser Act of 1855, where then some guy, Farnham, 
uh, said me Mexicans weren't masculine. <laughs> now, now, Barnum was just wrong on that. That's for sure. I know a lot of Mexicans. I've been there <laughs> right. several times. But okay. Yeah, and I don't know. I mean, I we addressed. I went over the, some of the legal arguments that he referred to last time. Um. Again, exclusion is argued. I mean, I don't know. At some point, I think you just have to say, are people allowed to make their arguments? The question is, what was the ruling and how did it get resolved? Which is eminently missing. Yeah. It, um, if it's not in the book, one it really has to think that he's he's got a pre-planned agenda here. I mean, I, I'm just saying, like, I mean, if you spend like 10 minutes on Twitter, yeah. like people make arguments for everything. Are you going to go quote them? Go, oh, this person's bad. This person's bad. Therefore... The system must go down. Obviously not. Twitter is still very much is actually expanding. All right. Uh, I think this is uh, maybe this is the penultimate. This is the penultimate section. Uh, Subtitle: Critical race theorists on gender race discrimination. And now he gets into Kimberly Crenshaw's uh, uh, work a little bit more. Yeah, the first quote in this section I just thought was a very interesting because it. It's almost like, you know, and, and I know like quite a few people do this. So we'll just make a quote and they just expect the quote itself just to de facto do the work. But he, right, but he quotes Kimberly Crenshaw when she says, um, notes that whereas antebellum and postbellum U.S. laws establish, quote, white male regulation of white female sexuality, there, end quote, there was, quote, absolutely no institutional effort to regulate black female chastity. Now, it's I not clear. I don't even know what that. So basically, he's just saying that in Southern society, men were supposed to watch out for how women, um, how like sexually active women were, but black women, it was kind of just a free ticket. Now, I don't, there's no institutional effort. It's not clear. So with, are you saying there should have been institutional effort on black women to, for their sexual relations? Or are you saying there should not have been institutional, uh, regulation on at all white women well yeah so it's like should there should have there been none or should there have been more um so then he says a similar lack of specific legal protection for black women characterized 20th century anti-discrimination law now again you still have that quote like okay so what are you supposed to do this is where i think the article begins to break down more in the contradictions yeah. So it, are there it, supposed it, to be more law? There's supposed to be less law. And he says, well, Blacks should have more protection. So there should be institutional regulation of Black, of black female chastity. Is that what we're saying? Because, I mean, there's nothing else. So what, what other specific legal protection is he referring to from the quote? Unless we just have to impute what we think. And maybe that's like um, make it, you know, having... Uh, black women who are raped legally punished if that's what he said but he didn't say that and so i think we're just left to impute something like that it's not very clear what he's referring to okay so crenshaw is famous obviously for intersectionality um where you know you would want laws tailored to the experiences of people who have overlapping features and each overlapping feature that they have adds to their degree of marginalization and suffering. Uh, yeah. I thought that's but my he, summary of inter intersectionality. I, that's not necessarily what the quote is here, but my summary is that uh, you have uh, people have different physical features or biological features um, and as they, as, as any of those features are entailed by one body, one physical body, uh, that physical body that we call a person, because I don't think these people necessarily are, I don't, maybe they believe in souls, I don't know. But what I, that physical bo body that bears uh, this variety, this set of properties um, that are all socially, social constructs though, right? Female, oh, black. Yeah. Maybe, yeah, I don't know if lesbian and heterosexual. Yeah. And that's hard to say as a social construct other than, but. Um, yeah, well, yeah, they're socially, so basically, yeah. 
They're yeah. socially constructed groups and an individual is just a representation of the intersection of whatever or however many groups there are. Social, of these social, socially constructed facts, I guess. Um, and yeah. then there, there has to be laws that are tailored to the specific set of socially constructed facts that each individual body represents. Yes. There you yes. go. But there's but there's two things that right. emerge from that. That because the question is why do you have to have tailor made laws? Well, it seems like there's two reasons. One is because they want to say, and this is um, Nathan quoting, is that it produces a compounded identity based injustice. That's what's going to has to account for that. So you have the the compound identities that intersectionality creates, and then you have the compound identity experiences. Yeah. So now you have socially constructed groups and those groups produce an individual unique set of experiences that and it's not clear what they mean by that because it could mean and this is i was talking to you a couple days ago about this tony um because chesterton brings this up as well materialism has to deal with this are you saying that an individual say for example they're just uh a black woman we'll just keep it simple black woman are you saying that this person has the intersection of black experiences and female experiences or is there a black female experience? And it's not, he's not, he doesn't make it clear in this paper, but then you get almost an infinite number of experiences. And that becomes problematic because then like, how do you know if it's an injustice? These well, are like highly privatized and highly unique experiences. That's where the Angela Harris uh, paper is illustrative, I think. Um, although she, uh, Angela Harris in the paper um, race and essentialism and feminist legal theory, where she's arguing against the idea that there's any sort of essential uh, female. There's nothing essential about femaleness, womanhood. There's no essential female voice. Um, and she starts breaking it down, but she opens with this interesting story by about, um, you know, this interesting story about Funes the Memorius where, um, you know, basically where language just doesn't refer to anything anymore. And this Funes, this character just, you know, has his own sort of private language that nobody else can understand. And it's just a system of categorizing and that's it, you know? So where does, but she does, so she doesn't want to take intersectionality or anti-essentialism to the point where you do, you just have an infinite number of personal experiences and that's who the person is and then somehow you're going to have to figure out how to have a kind of justice tailored to this just this uh totally uh sort of custom per custom uh, that this, this person who's just who just is their set of experiences yeah well and this is why uh, this goes back to the point i was just making about the not getting group identities off the ground if you there's no clear demarcation of what a group is and if until you have a clear demarcation of what a group is then that it only can be reducible to these highly individualistic experiences and then the question is you know when someone's telling you a sad story i mean this goes to like lewis's argument in the abolition of man when when you see a waterfall is it beautiful be, are you recognizing its beauty or is it spurring in you feelings that you call beauty and so then when you're hearing a story from another person about the injustice, is it truly injustice or is it inspiring in you a feeling of injustice, which would be very independent from what the other person could be expressing? You right. have no access to the external world, no access to other people's experiences. I mean, and, and this is in, in Harris's own paper. Um, and these are mainly from, I can't remember when this one was written, but most of these came out in the 90s. Mm -hmm. And she says this, I want, I mean, people should, think about what how this actually how these views actually wind up working out when people just get together and hang out <laughs> like at a conference yeah she says and i'm quoting angela harris quote third feminist essentialism off which she's she's attacking that idea third feminist essentialism offers women not only intellectual and emotional comfort but the opportunity to play all too familiar power games, both amongst, among themselves and with men. 
feminist essentialism provides multiple arenas. So actually there's, there's two horns of a dilemma here. She's saying that feminist essentialism provides multiple arenas for power struggle, which cross cut one another in complex ways. The game's womanship is palpable at any reasonably diverse gathering of feminists with a political agenda. The participants are busy constructing hierarchies of oppression using their own suffering and consequent innocence to win the right to define, quote, woman's exper women's experience or to demand particular political concessions for their interest group. White women stress women's commonality, which enables them to control the group's agenda. Black women make reference to 200 years of slavery and argue that their needs should come first. Eventually, as the group seems ready to splinter in mutually suspicious and self-righteous factions, someone reminds the group that after all, women are women and we are all oppressed by men. And solidarity reappears through the threat of a common enemy, end quote. Now, that, that's this problem, what she says of, of essentialism, where then you have people just competing essentialisms, I guess. But that's not really essentialism. No. Well, I think that's exactly. I think what you, yeah. is, it's, it's human nature is the argument. Yeah. If human nature, that's a reaffirmation. It's, because it's then you get cross experiences. Like you yeah. run the same problem if you have male and female. Because I think the argument against female essentialism works once you acknowledge that there are a multiplicity of essentials, I guess. A multiplicity of natures within the human race i guess in which right. then yeah then you can have competing because then why why not you, you go again then you go into the credit you know, this intersectionality it emerges naturally once you deny human nature then the argument is, is that you know, everything has their own unique nature and it just evolves into what she said is this competing views and trying to use her power goes straight to power dynamics and what's interesting how are you going to incorporate then at some point you're going to run out of uh publicly accessible sort of forensic features of a person like their their um their skin color their gender um well the question it's a question whether or not these are publicly accessible but at some point you're getting yeah that's what like, i would say is like you i think they nix that off that's how they intersection yeah. is that i mean that's why you have to have laws that are tailored because otherwise you're not capturing their experience right but at some point you're going to get down to what like a raw experience like person x was raped as a child and person Y was not raped in their childhood. I mean, you're going to get down to some yeah, raw outside of their theory. Yeah. You'd have to, of well, this goes back to the podcast we just did the idea of suffering, the person getting right. decapitated thing. Like the facts of the world is such that he can't, it's not a lack or a production of the imagination that he's being executed. Like, in this, in the, in the, in the least, as you were, we were talking about your experiences, right, not your experiences, but what you're going yeah. through over, overseas. Which I think ultimately that's what's going on here is people are trying to figure out how, you know, at the end of the day, this is yet another human attempt to sort of what Horkheimer, Max Horkheimer said, you know, it just, he wanted to hold on to some kind of re, uh, religious, you know, view because he could not live with the fact that the rapist is going to get away with it. You yeah. know, I mean, I'm paraphrasing some something that he kind of said. I just can't. He couldn't live with the view that the rapist or the murderer just gets away with it. Critical race theory is about justice. What's the problem? I mean, at the end of the day, what we're trying to, is is a very human attempt to try and figure out the problem of pain and suffering, and it's just yeah. it's not going to work. It, no, it's not. Well, in, in later in the essay, because I know we have to wrap up on time. Yeah. Maybe we can do a part two. Um, yeah, we he will brings do. up this court case where he says, "Isn't it wrong?" that a black man walking down the, a street that a white woman's on is charged with rape just for walking down the same street. Now, I think under a, an essential, a human essentialist view, absolutely that's wrong. Law yeah. is in place, morality is in place. You can say very quickly, it is wrong. Once you introduce intersectionality though, it becomes at best questionable because if, if we're dealing with personal experience based upon group identity, then what is the argument that the white woman didn't experience rape, rape or feel by doing that or the feeling of rape by which law had to be tailor made to make an account for that? You, you, you lose a lot of ground. Well, and now here we are 
and we see, you know, and we're seeing this play out in everything from cancel culture to microaggressions. <clears throat> so I had, I had the, the feeling that I was raped. I had the feeling that I was racially victimized to use Dr. Cartagena's own words. He's got wounds. Uh, I don't think he was attacked physically by one of his philosophy professors at Texas A&M or Baylor. I don't think anybody like said, oh, there's a Hispanic PhD candidate, let's go beat him up. Um, but somehow he incurred wounds. Uh, we've yeah. asked this question in the first essay. It's a very strong accusation. I think it sounds like a strong accusation. So, um, you know, according to, if we go down this road, then if, if Dr. Cartagena can claim that he has racialized wounds because somebody, uh, I don't know, looked at, asked him to leave one of the classrooms one day and he didn't know why, but he felt it was racially motivated. Well, then why, again, why, like you said, why is the woman who walks down the street and sees a black person, a black man pass her, if she feels like he was sexually aggressing against her, then he, she, he was sexually aggra aggressing against her. Yeah. And that's where I think people should begin to realize that this human nature, nature essentialism, I guess you want to call it, and the idea appeal to hard facts of the situation, what actually took place yeah. is very intuitive. Like we can see that and go, that was a wrong ruling. Why? Because we can say that much can be imagined, much can be said, but given that they're both fundamentally equal, you can't just appeal to someone's imagining. Like what happened? Right. You know, in this case, if she was not raped, then you can't charge him with rape. Why? Because how it, it's the law. This is how the law is applied to different situations, given the context of the scenario and the fact that, I mean, this is, but you've gone, uh, done away with all of that. At this point, law as universalizable concept is no longer applied. You have intersectional experiences. You're running out of room to say that that's actually wrong, except by appealing indirectly, I think to the outrage, to the moral and legal consequences that you just spent your entire two papers attacking. Well, um, well, we'll have to wrap up, but we will do an addendum to this uh, video where we finish off the last of the essays here. Uh, we don't have much left to go, but I think um, just to sum up, um, I'm, I'm not convinced that in this essay, Dr. Cartagena has brought any clarity uh, for, uh, pastors, church elders, um, other kinds of church leaders. I don't think he's brought much clarity to the question of critical race theory. And I, because of that, I see no reason, uh, as of yet to accept it as some kind of tool for the church to use in social issues. And certainly, uh, I don't see it in any way as a means to revitalize the church's evangelism. I know those were Robert Romero's words, but I think Dr. Cartagena was certainly on board with that idea that if we were to accept critical race theory uh, ideas into the church, it would somehow revitalize our church life or our evangelism. I don't think that's the case at all. Yeah, yeah. and I and again, you know, I, real quick, I think the idea that we wanna pick the good and leave the bad of CRT was never done. So for those institutions, you know, or you're a part of an organization that's listening and you're hearing people say, oh, we'll just take the good and leave the bad, or yeah, leave, leave the bad. That's not happening from the scholars that he's quoting and it's not happening from the way in which he's portraying himself. And then the second part is that, um, so there's no, there's no sense of Christianizing CRT essentially. And right. the second one is, if, if you're gonna run with CRT as just a method, intersectionality isn't, that is, that is a worldview. Yeah, making metaphysical system. in a metaphysical and epistemological limits so problematic um that like it's just a crt and, and like nathan said like the scholars he's quoting intersectionality is necessary for crt to have an adequate explanation now i go far and say yeah because you can't solve the group problem metaphysically so you have to have a competing metaphysical theory like intersectionality to get it off the ground which is, i think is what they've done but to say it's just a method i think is it's becoming more disingenuous, I think. I would agree. And we, we are seeing good resistance now uh, put
pushing back against uh, critical race theory, not just from guys who've been doing it for a long time, like Bodie Bauckham, but now from just across the culture from people, Christians, non-Christians, you know, yeah. just all over the place. So, um, which is, I think, good to see. So I'd say at this point, um, again, just to reiterate, there, there's no good reason at all for any church, any pastor, any seminary to, I mean, you can teach it. We can teach about critical race theory all day long. Let's teach it in our classrooms about it and where it came from and everything. But the idea of embracing it, accepting it or endorsing it, I don't see any good reason. I say a lot, I see a lot of bad reasons, uh, uh, for doing, you know, that would count against it. So, all right, Logan, we'll see you next time to finish up. See you. All right. Thanks.